President. Senator from Vermont. The President has consent to call the quorum and get to I'd be dispensed with. Without objection. Morning business is closed on the previous order. The Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination, the judiciary. Margot Kitsi Brody of New York to be United States District Judge for the Eastern District of New York. And uh, Mr. President, am I correct that the order is such that uh, the vote would be at 530? The order is actually for 60 minutes of debate. I'd ask consent that the vote be at 530. Without objection, so ordered. And certainly if uh, the ranking member comes to the floor and wishes to change that, I would not object. But earlier this month, the Senate finally ended a four-month and two-day filibuster of the confirmation of Judge Alberto Jordan. Because we end that filibuster, he's now the first Cuban-American to serve on the 11th Circuit. We also finally ended the five-month filibuster of the nomination of Jesse Furman, a former counselor to Attorney General Mukasey, Attorney General under George W. Bush, and is now a confirmed federal trial judge in the Southern District of New York. Now, the majority leader should not have had to file cloture petitions for the Senate to vote on these two outstanding judicial nominations. Senate Republicans have filibustered nine of President Obama's judicial nominations despite the fact that he reached out to both Republican and Democratic home state senators and nominated qualified, ideologically moderate men and women to fill vacancies on that federal court. Nomination Margo, Margo Brody should have been confirmed last year. For all, she was reported unanimously, every Republican, every Democrat, on the Senate Judiciary Committee. But look what happened to Jesse Furman. Federal prosecutor, also served as a top legal advisor, Attorney General McKay, Michael McCasey, during the George W. Bush administration. He was involved with the prosecution of the Times Square bomber, the infamous Russian spies, and the Pakistani scientist with ties to Al-Qaeda, whose actions were responsible for the 1998 bombings of the U.S. Embassy in Kenya and Tanzania, the sort of person that any president, Republican or Democratic, would want on the bench. He had impeccable credentials, including having clerked for Justice David Souter in the United States Supreme Court. That's why he was voted out unanimously. But then, obstructions and delays. In the start, I must say, my friends on the other side of the aisle, the Republican senators have applied a double standard to President Obama's nominees. They have departed dramatically from the long tradition of deference to home state senators and district court nominees. You know, since 1945, since 1945, the Judiciary Committee has reported more than 2,100 district court nominees to the Senate. Of those 2,100 nominees, only six have been reported by party line votes, only six in the last 65 years. Five of those six party line votes have been by Republican senators against President Obama's highly qualified district court nominees. Just think of that. Since 1945, you've only had six party line votes against district court nominees, five of them against President Obama's nominees. In fact, only 22 of those 2,100 district court nominees were reported by any kind of split roll call vote at all. And eight of those, more than a third, have been by Republican senators choosing to oppose President Obama's nominees. Actually, it made very clear, President Obama's nominees are going to be treated differently than those of any president, Democratic or Republican, before him. That's why Jesse Foreman was stalled for more than five months. And actually, the majority leader was able to break through and schedule a debate and vote. I saw something else I've not seen before. Republican senators who had supported the nomination, after studying it for months, when it was before the Judiciary Committee for a hearing, they had been to the hearing, studied it, voted for him, 
they flipped and changed their votes. 34 Republican senators voted against this highly qualified person, former prosecutor, former key assistant to Republican Attorney General McCasey. You know, it's hard to understand why we would do this. All it does is politicize the federal court and hurts all of us. Now, in this case, Margot Brody has practiced law for 20 years, including working as a federal prosecutor in Brooklyn for the last 12. She successfully prosecuted numerous cases, all kinds of matters. She has the support of both her home state senators. Let's stop holding up this excellent woman. Let's get her confirmed tonight. Because after all, we're more than 40 confirmations behind the pace we set confirming President Bush's judicial nominees in 2001 through 2004. We've got to go back to what we did earlier. Mr. President, I'd ask consent by full statement to be part of the record. And Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent. With, without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that Ed Chung, a Department of Justice detail, on my Judiciary Committee staff be given Senate floor privileges for the duration of the 112th Congress. Without objection. Mr. President, the A's and A's been ordered? They have not. I ask for the A's and A's. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka, <coughs> Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayat. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bacchus, Mr. Baggage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal. Who is it? Who is it? Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Conrad, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. DeMint, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrain, Mr. Graham, <clears throat> Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heller, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inouye, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Colt, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrieu, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr.
Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Luger, Mr. Manchin, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Rich, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Snow, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, yes. Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Mr. Webb, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden. Senators having voted in the affirmative. Bingaman, Boxer, Burr, Cantwell, Cochran, Conrad, Crapo, Johans, Kyle, Leahy, Nelson of Nebraska, Roberts, Tester, Udall of New Mexico. No senators having voted in the negative. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coates. Aye. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin. Aye. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons. Aye. Mr. Alexander, Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Carey, Mr. Carey, aye. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Cardin, aye.
Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor, aye. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Isaacson, aye. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Webb, Mr. Webb, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall of Colorado, aye. Mr. Gillibrand. This is Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye. Mr. Paul. Uh, yes. Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, South Dakota, aye. Mr. Bacchus. Mr. Bacchus, aye. Mr. Luger, <coughs> Mr. Luger, aye. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller, aye.
Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Toomey. Aye. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Chambliss. Aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mrs. Hagan. Hi, Pete. Mrs. Hagan. Aye. Mr. Moran. You here to win. Mr. Moran. Mr. Tesson. Aye. You here till six? I am. Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Lieberman. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mrs. Shaheen. Mrs. Shaheen. Aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Mr. Rish. What's up, Pete? How was your trip? Mr. Rish. Aye. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Menendez. Aye. Mr. Franken. Mr. Franken. Aye. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins. Aye. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Whitehouse. Aye. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Levin. Mr. Levin. Aye. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Mr. Renzi. Mr. Renzi. Aye. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Aye. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown of Ohio, aye. Mr. Corker, Mr. Corker, aye. Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hatch, aye. Ms. Ayat. Ms. Ayat. Aye.
Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper. Aye. Ms. Snow. Ms. Snow. Aye. Mr. Domain. Mr. Domain. No. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven. Aye. Mr. Kaka. Mr. Kaka. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Sessions, Mr. Sessions, aye. Ms. Mikulski, Ms. Mikulski, aye. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby, aye. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, aye. Mrs. Hutchison. Mrs. Hutchison. Aye. Mr. Heller. Mr. Heller. Aye.
do it. Mrs. Murkowski. Mrs. Murkowski, aye.
Mrs. Murray. Mrs. Murray. Aye. Mr. Begich. Mr. Begich. Aye. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed of Nevada, aye. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer, aye. Are there any senators wishing to vote or to change their vote? Seeing none, the, the yeas are 86, the nays are two. Uh, the nomination is confirmed. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table. The president will be immediately notified of the Senate's action and the Senate will resume legislative session. Under the previous order, there will be a period of morning business up to 60 minutes, equally divided and controlled by Senators Pryor and Alexander. Madam the Senator from Tennessee. Thank you, Madam. <coughs> Madam President, I ask consent that Senator Pryor and I and designated Senators be allowed to, to uh, speak at, in a colloquy. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, uh, some of the senators on the Republican side have other appointments to make, so I'm going to defer my remarks till the end of the colloquy. And uh, what, what I will do is first uh, take, state why we're here, and second, go to Senator Isaacson, and then we'll go to Senator Pryor, and then back to Senator Collins, if we, if we may. Uh, Madam President, uh, our leaders, the Democratic leader, the majority leader, and the Republican leader, um, sometimes get criticized. They have hard jobs, and we recognize that. We also recognize that they can't do their jobs unless we do our jobs well. And so tonight, what some of us thought we would do on the Democratic side and the Republican side is apply a a management principle that's called catching people doing things right. 
And we believe that the majority leader and the minority leader and Senator Inouye, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Senator Cochran, the ranking member, are doing things exactly right when they say that it is their intention to try to move all 12 of our appropriations bills through the Appropriations Committee uh, and get them to the floor so that we can deal with them before the next fiscal year starts. And we are here not just to compliment them, but to pledge to them our support in helping them achieve that goal. Now, there are many important reasons we should do that, but basically it is our constitutional responsibility to do it, to appropriate money. It is a time when we need to save every penny we can, and this is our best opportunity for oversight, and it's also good management. And it would put the Senate uh, doing what the Senate ought to do, which is consider legislation, uh, have a hearing, ask questions, cut out what ought to be cut out, add what ought to be added, vote on it, bring it to the floor, amend it, debate on it, and pass it or defeat it. That's what we should be doing. And only twice since 2000 has this Senate actually considered every single one of the 12 appropriations bills. Only twice in 2001 and 2005. So it's been seven years since we've considered every single one of the appropriations bills, which is our most basic responsibility, appropriate oversight, and this involves more than a trillion dollars of taxpayer funds. So Madam President, that's why we're here tonight. Our leaders have said this is what their intention is. We're here to say you're right, congratulations, we compliment you, and we're here to help you succeed because it's very difficult for our leaders to succeed if they don't have any followers making it possible for them to achieve their goals. Now, Madam President, I'd like to uh, defer to Senator Isaacson and then to Senator Pryor. I thank Senator Alexander for giving me a moment on the floor, and it's ironic that when I received the call last week asking if I'd participate in this colloquy, I was traveling my state doing town hall meetings. And I was near Ultawa, Tennessee, as a matter of fact, on Thursday night. I was north of Dalton, Georgia, in Murray County. We had a town hall meeting. This fellow at the back of the room raised his hand when it came time for questions. He said, Mr. Isaacson, I've got a question for you. And I said, what's that? He said, you know, last, my, last night my wife and I amended our budget that we established in December for this year because some things have not gone so well, and we had to recast how we're spending our money so we wouldn't go any further in debt than we already are. Why can't you all do the same thing? Y'all talking about us. A few days earlier in Dublin, Georgia, a great prosperous town in South Georgia, a similar question was asked by a Chamber of Commerce director who just couldn't understand why the federal government and the Congress of the United States could not wrap its arm around fiscal responsibility, have a budget, and have appropriations and acts that come to the floor. They're debated, they're amended, and the spending of the United States of America's government is spent like the households of the United States of America have to spend their money. So I want to commend you and Senator Pryor for bringing this to the floor, and I want to commend our leaders for making affirmative statements about the desire to bring the 12 appropriation bills to the floor of the Senate, debate them, let us amend them, let's bring them together. You know, if you think about it, in the last three years, we've had a situation in the last three years where we either had continuing resolutions or omnibus appropriations. During a difficult period of time where we've had deficits of $1.3 to $1.5 trillion, we haven't taken the time to debate how we're spending our money, where we're spending our money, and do it in the context of what we call on the floor regular order. In fact, it's not hard to understand why only 11% of the American people right now view the Congress as favorable, because they can't understand our inability to do the things they have to do themselves. IRS doesn't take excuses on April the 15th if you're not ready. You've got to be ready. If you're a business and you are filed as an LLC or a sub-S corporation, on the 15th of January, the 15th of April, the 15th of June, and the 15th of September, you file a quarterly tax return, and if you don't, you're held accountable. We're now going into our fourth year, and it looks like for the first time in the last three years, we're going to have debates on the floor of how we spend the American people's money. I want to commend Senator Alexander and Senator Pryor, and I want to thank our leadership for making the statement of the desire to do so. And I have already seen Senator Inouye, and I've already seen Senator Cochran working diligently in the basic appropriations subcommittees to see to it those bills come to the floor. So I think it's time we did our business like the American people had to do their business, and I commend you, Senator Alexander, and you, Senator Pryor, for calling this colloquy tonight. 
Madam President. The Senator from Arkansas. Madam President, thank you. Um, I, since we have other senators on the floor, what I'd like to do is withhold my comments until a few of our other senators have a chance to speak, if, if that would be uh, uh, permissible with Senator Alexander. Uh, Madam President, uh, I appreciate the courtesy from the Senator from Arkansas. The Senator from Maine is here. She has another appointment and she has waited and I look forward to hearing what she has to say. Madam President. Senator from Maine. Madam President, first let me thank the Senator from Arkansas and the Senator from Tennessee for their usual courtesies, but also for organizing this colloquy on the Senate floor this evening. I'm very pleased to join my colleagues as we talk about the goal of taking up the fiscal year 2013 appropriations bills in what we in the Senate call the regular order. Well, what does that mean? As the presiding officer is well aware, that means we would bring up each of the individual bills. They would be open to full and fair debate. They would be amended. They would be voted on. And we would avoid having some colossal bill at the end of the year that combines all the appropriations bills together those bills are often thousands of pages in length. A lot of times some of the provisions have not had the opportunity to be thoroughly vetted. They really aren't very transparent and they contribute to the public's concern about the way that we do business here in Washington. I too want to join in commending the majority leader, the Republican leader, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee and the vice chairman of the Appropriations Committee for their commitment to try to work together in a bipartisan fashion so that each and every one of the Appropriations Bill can be brought before the full Senate so that we can work our will on each of these bills. Madam President, I would suggest that it is important to the Senate as an institution that we achieve this goal. It's also important for the American people to see that we can carry out our constitutional responsibility and most of all, it is important for restoring trust in government that we work together in an open and bipartisan manner to establish priorities to make the tough spending decisions that will be required and to complete the work on time that the Constitution requires of us. I think it's important to remember that these bills make important investments in research, economic development, infrastructure, our national defense, education, health care, that, that these bills not only create jobs now when they are needed most, but also establish the foundations for future growth. And just as important to our economic future is the need to rein in federal spending. Our work must continue to the go toward the goal of getting our national debt under control. And the best way for us to achieve these goals is for each and every one of the appropriations bills to come before the full Senate and for us to work our will on those bills. That, Madam President, is the way the Senate should operate, is the way that we must operate in order to restore the faith of the American people in this institution. 
So I want to put my full statement in the record, and I would ask unanimous consent that I do so. Without objection. Thank you. And let me just conclude my remarks by thanking Senator Alexander and Senator Pryor for initiating this colloquy tonight. This is a way that we can come together, and America will be better for it. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I see uh, Senator Warner, uh, the Senator from Virginia, has arrived too. With Senator Pryor, has been uh, uh, very active over the last several months in, in in working across party lines to try to make the Senate function more effectively. And uh, I would leave it to Senator Pryor as to what comes next. If it's agreeable with the senator from Tennessee, I'd like to ask the senator from Virginia to say just a few words. We understand uh, he has a pressing engagement. I don't think it gets any more pressing than when it's your wife's birthday. So uh, uh, he would like to say a few words, and then uh, if, that, if that's permissible with the senator from Tennessee. Well, I appreciate the courtesy of the senator from, from Arkansas and, and my good friend the senator from Tennessee for initiating this effort. And, um, again, uh, uh, as a relatively new senator to, in effect, jump the line, I apologize. It, would, it was only in, uh, I think about the presiding officer, in the interest of, uh, of um, family values, since if I'm not getting to my wife's birthday in about 30 minutes, I may be able here to give a, a, a much more extended remarks. Uh, but I just want to join my other colleagues as as a senator who's only had the opportunity to serve in this body for three years, I hear a number of my uh, more senior colleagues talk about uh, the old days, or the days when the Senate um, took in an orderly fashion the, the business of, of the people and debated uh, in, in vigorous fashion, um, but came to conclusion on issues that confronted the country. Um, we have done some of that in the three years, and I have came in with the presiding officer, and there were issues of, of major importance that we have debated. But too often in recent times, uh, we have not had the flavor of those kind of debates. And while we can disagree about many of the great issues of the day, as a former business person, there is nothing more important than to give predictability to the enterprise that we call the federal government. And the way we do that is by passing spending bills, the appropriations bills, where hard choices are made about which programs to fund, which programs not to fund. Uh, as someone who, again, like my friend, the senator from Tennessee and the senator from both senators from Arkansas and the presiding officer, I have enormous concerns about our debt and deficit, and we're going to have to make hard, hard choices. Uh, but if we're going to make those choices, we need a full and and vigorous debate, a debate where amendments are offered, uh, where procedural tactics are not used to slow that debate, and that uh, the will of the Senate can act. So I understand that the majority leader and the, uh, the Republican leader have reached some accommodation to try to start a new wave of business, uh, and, and, and the first step of that business should be having us uh, in a fair and orderly process debate appropriations bills. Uh, make those hard choices and, and move on. So I want to, again, thank uh, the courtesy of my colleagues, but particularly thank the senator from Tennessee and the senator from, senior senator from Arkansas for bringing us together here on this, the floor to uh, lend our voices. I mean, this might even be kind of like a volunteer fire department where, you know, members of the Senate can come down on an issue of importance. I, I heard the call. Uh, earlier today that there were going to be senators down here talking on this important issue, and I'm glad to add my voice to that. And with that, uh, 